Warning, do not listen to this podcast if hearing about freedom and liberty is not legal for you in your community. And if so, you should immediately move to a hipper community. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Podcast, where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi cover the punk rockinist, hip hopinist current events, as well as timeless universal truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because there's no such thing as half free. The Freedom Fiends Podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Distance Learning Anarchy Series with Freedom Fiends Michael W. Dean. Broadcasting from my windowless bunker. And Nima Vidati. Go, go, Freedom Fiends! All right, fellow Freedom Fiends, this is your boy Nima. It's going to just be me today. Michael's actually sick. DJ called me and said that uh, Michael, I guess, woke up, looked at DJ and said, "Ah, I'm too sick. Call Nima. Um, So... You know, I felt like we can't leave the fiends hanging. Uh, I get that thing from South Park stuck in my head. If you've ever seen the episode called Cartoon Wars, I think it's a multiple parter. Uh, But the premise is Cartman hates Family Guy. (laughs) And it turns out um, all the jokes are written by manatees who bounce around balls that are a noun, a subject, and a verb, etc. And that's why all the jokes are just random and have nothing to do with the plot. Like, I once saw Muhammad drinking tea by a Uh, park things that are silly like that so uh, I digress though the point was that uh, in the episode um, Kyle who actually likes Family Guy doesn't want Cartman to succeed in getting rid of Family Guy because once you take one episode off the air once you pull it you set that precedent of if somebody complains it's off the air or for whatever reasons it's off the air then that's the death knell for the show so I felt like we don't need a death knell for the fiends we need to keep the fiends going strong Uh, so we had to do something right we can't just leave it hanging and have blank space and and not send anything to the LRN feed and and have all those fiends that are looking for their fiend fit go to look in their their podcatcher and come up empty-handed i would feel very bad for that so i guess i'll just go ahead and rant here for a little bit i've got a few things to cover uh we won't have michael's irreverence unfortunately but uh you will have lots of nema and i'll try to be smooth and funny and fair and uh we'll see where it leads so um Back to Michael being sick, I kind of want to talk about why that is, and um, he actually called me yesterday and wanted a podcast. I was at work, so he was like, do you want to do that thing where we talk over the phone and I try to record it and we make it a podcast? And I didn't really want to do that. The sound quality for cell phones is so bad, and, and really the way it is when me and him talk at work, it's like we talk for like five minutes and then I have to hang up. I got to go do something. I put him in my pocket. That's what I say. I say, wait in my pocket. And I throw the phone in my pocket, take care of business and go about. And and then I grab the phone again and start talking. So didn't really feel up to doing that. Plus, you know, I can't really have a computer in front of me with my notes. I can do it on the phone, but I don't really have a good handset worked out yet. So it would have just been a cluster frack. And we said, "Ah, let's not do that. But uh, the reason Michael called me is he He's been having problems, not only because he's sick, but because of the state. Um, I've had these problems too. My wife has had these problems. When you're sick, at least when you're sick enough, um, you often decide to go to a doctor and or or an urgent care clinic or or whatever you can get your hands on. Um, Not even not even for their advice sometimes, but just because they have a government-imposed, a government-created monopoly on writing these things called prescriptions, which are basically permission slips for you to buy certain medicines. Um, That's how I put it simply. So that's a good way to put it because you can realize the ridiculousness of it. You know, the, the state always tries to use these fancy words like prescription or taxes or uh, a draft to mask what those 
those actions really are. And a prescription to me is nothing more than a government, a state-sponsored permission slip to get a certain medication. Um, try to think about how you would feel about if the state required this kind of permission slip for other things. I mean, they obviously do for a few things, not just medicine. But um, think if you had to have a quote-unquote prescription for buying a quarter pounder with cheese. How about a prescription for a six-pack of beer or a bottle of champagne on the new year? Um, it would just be completely ridiculous. And so to me, that's all a prescription is, is I think of it in the same light as if the government required their permission um, in order to do any of those things, in order to buy any of those things. So Michael goes to the doctor, and the doctor treats him like crap, basically yells at him for smoking, yells at him for not getting a flu shot. Uh, I don't want to give all of Michael's rant, but this is sort of a secondhand rant. I'm sure he'll want to re-give it once he's back on the mic. Um, but the doctor basically made him feel like crap. Um, and <laughs> then his wife the next day went to go get another portion of his medicine because the doctor prescribed him, uh, I believe, an antibiotic, but was also going to prescribe him a non-narcotic cough medication, uh, something that used to be over-the-counter, something that's still over-the-counter in certain countries in Europe, uh, something that shouldn't be a big deal. And uh, I don't know the details on this, but apparently the people at the prescription counter were mean to Michael's wife about it, I guess were implying that she was doing something untowards with this. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing maybe they were giving her problems because it was his prescription instead of hers and she was trying to pick it up. Uh, this is just conjecture because Michael wanted to tell the whole story with the details himself. But um, it is true that, that these folks doing the will of the state um, inflicted emotional pain and hurt in Michael's wife. And it's just a shame because this, this is an area of life that doesn't need any extra pain invoked from a third party. When you're sick or your spouse is sick, you should be able to devote all of your efforts or any leftover efforts you have after working and doing what you need to do uh, towards getting your partner well, towards um, doing the thing you're supposed to do, which is make them feel better. And when these silly rules and this red tape steps in and keeps you or your spouse from getting better, uh, it's a real shame. And it's a real good example of how the state and this concept of somebody else, um, some third party controlling transactions, of how that really does hurt people, like literally hurts people, literally keeps them sick. I mean, obviously, this is a small example, but the small examples are important. I mean, if you wanted to take the bigger example of, of the same principle, you could look at the Iraq sanctions where the government preventing voluntary economic transactions to the country of Iraq uh, basically was responsible for 500,000 kids starving to death and getting sick to death and not getting medicine and not getting food because the U.S. government pointed its guns at people and said, don't sell anything to those folks. That's the bigger principle. So it's horribly tragic there, but it also affects each and every one of us. And I think it's really important to remember that. So um, it, it made me remember and it made Michael remember even when he was talking to me on the phone um, – Having something like a drug show akin to having a, a, the way gun shows work now, that'd be really nice, wouldn't it? Uh, having a place that was sort of an agora, free from the state's creeping eyes, free from the goon's silly regulations. A place where you could go and maybe stock up on antibiotics, stock, stock up on any meds you need. Um, anything that you feel will keep you alive. Hell, anything that you feel will further your happiness. And that's what it's supposed to be, right? I mean, even the state says, even the Declaration of Independence, not the Declaration, even the Bill of Rights says, uh, or I guess it is the, one of those things says pursuit of happiness. <laughs> you get the point. Um, I mean, they obviously don't follow it, but shouldn't they? Shouldn't that be a basic human right to pursue whatever makes you happy, to pursue whatever you want? Um, and that's universal. Everybody can pursue their own happiness. Uh, where it comes into conflicts with others' happiness, then you have a conflict and you can work that out, conflict resolution. Uh, and you obviously can't take away somebody else's right to pursue their happiness. Um, so, I mean, I don't think practically anything like a drug show would really work. But that's the kind of things we need to be thinking of. Uh, things like that. Loopholes. 
Loopholes are the light through which capitalism can still breathe. It's the holes through which any vestige of freedom can still get air. Um, so find those loopholes. Uh, I won't use the word exploit because it's not exploitative. Find those loopholes and use them. Take deep breaths from them. Um, and I think we need more of things like that. I don't really know the logistics of it. I'm more of an ideas guy. <laughs> I sort of rant on what I feel would be right. I'm not the most organized person. Um, but that's the beauty of The Fiends, and that's the beauty of what we do here, is we can be like the think tank. Um, and I hope, I hope to the creator or nature or whatever you think, I hope to humanity that uh, things like this, things where freedom is paramount and people are actually taken care of, uh, can one day exist. And I hope that talking about them and envisioning them will help to make them exist. All right. Um, I've got another story. I didn't expect the Michael rant to take that long. I was kind of worried that uh, I wouldn't be able to fill the whole time. I still don't think I will. I think it'll be a little bit shorter of a podcast. Um, but I guess I'm not so worried anymore that I will run out of things to say because I've got a, a few notes here and a bunch more stuff to cover. Um, so next, we'll go ahead and I've got a personal story to tell. Uh, it's kind of interesting, kind of funny. Um, it's a very interesting experience for me, I guess I'll say. But um, I was uh, delivering pizzas last night. Um, I do that at night often. And, you know, making a little money. It was New Year's Eve. Uh, oh, Happy New Year, by the way. It was New Year's Eve last night, the night before I recorded this. And I was driving. It was kind of drizzly. It's been really drizzly in Austin. Uh, not really raining hard, but... Kind of reminds me of what it was like when I visited uh, Portland. You know, just a constant light drizzle all day, every day. It's been like that for about three days here. So the roads are slick. Uh, you got to have the windshield wipers on. Not a whole lot of visibility, yada, yada. I'm driving. I, um, I take a left uh, under an overpass. I get onto, you know, a city street, uh, but a wide city street four lanes wide, you know, it's a main artery. Uh, nobody's on it. We're talking 1130 on New Year's Eve. So pretty much everybody is inside of somewhere awaiting the ball to drop or whatever you people do. You people. <laughs> and I, um, I'm driving and I don't even notice how fast I go. Apparently I'm going fast, but I can't think it's more than 10 miles over the speed limit. Although, really, I don't even pay attention to those signs anymore. I go whatever feels right. Um, apparently at my own detriment sometimes, but not this time. What happened was uh, I saw cop headlights in my rear view, which... Um, if you drive any extended amount of time, you quickly pick up. Your brain sees those. I think in your brain's eye, uh, those are predators. Those are predator eyes, those cop headlights. That's what you see them as. At least that's the reaction I get. So I see uh, these tiger or panther eyes, these these um, cop car headlights in my rear view. And I immediately go, oh, shit. Um, and then they start flashing their little spotlight you know, not their red, blue, blinky, pretty lights, but their little spotlight uh, that they hold like a wiener and flash at you. So they're flashing me with that. And I'm like, all right, well, I'll, I'll slowly move over to the edge here and see what happens. So do that. And uh, they pull up next to me. We're at a red light. And I roll down my window. And in the passenger seat of the cop car is a woman cop. She rolls down her window, too. Uh, she looks at me like she's... Kind of like she's my mom. No, not like my mom, because there's no nurturing in it. Uh, it was like like a teacher on her period. Well, I guess I shouldn't be sexist. Like a mean teacher. That's what she looks at me like. Uh, and she yells at me to slow down. Now, they're not, they didn't pull me over. They don't have their red and blues on. She's just yelling at me. She says, slow down. You were hauling ass. I wasn't really hauling ass. But, you know, I defer. I want to uh, create... I want to prevent any escalation, so I defer. I say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I will definitely slow down. Um, before I can finish my sentence, though, they get slammed into. They get rear-ended by another car who either didn't see them or slid because the roads were slick, and bam, 
smash into the back of this cop car that's next to me. And I can see that poor woman's head fling back in sort of a whiplash style. And she looks in pain and she grunts and she grabs her neck. And my heart went out to her. You know, she's being a state functionary, but at that moment, she's a person. She's a human being that is hurt. And so my instinct was to first express sympathy and then see if she needed me to help at all. So I, I say, I say, you know, oh my, I exclaim something like, oh my God, or holy crap, or whatever it, is, whatever it was that I said. And uh, I said, are you okay? Uh, do you need any help? And without missing a, well, I guess she did miss a beat as she was grabbing her neck in pain. But the first thing out of her mouth when she raised her head up and looks at me again was to continue to reprimand me. <laughs> she she couldn't reach into her, hum her humanity at that point. She couldn't just be somebody who was hurt, who somebody else was trying to help. No, she had to continue to be the authoritative figure that was yelling at the peon who must obey. Indeed, he must obey so much that as I am being hurt, I will with my, my next breath continue the authoritativeness. She yells at me again and says, slow down. Now, at this point, I'm not even driving, you know. The whole time she was telling me to slow down, I'm parked. I slow down from what? I'm going zero. Zero is my velocity. I can't slow down that's important i guess if it was a vector what what's that other one i guess i could go negative but that would just be in the opposite direction so it's just ridiculous that she's telling me to slow down again now you know at the time i'm still in the heat of the moment so i say okay yes ma'am i sir i sure will and uh i i say do you, do you guys need help do you want me to get out and help you what do you need uh no response, just still yelling at me. So I said, well, I'll get out of your way so you guys can take care of this. You know, I framed it that way. Like, I'm going to get out of the way so you guys can deal with this. I don't want to cause any more trouble. And I just skirt, skirt off. I didn't really skirt off, but, you know, I, I got the F out of there uh, and fast. <laughs> so um, after that, a friend of mine at work, because I had to tell the story. I, I've never been pulled over or almost been pulled over or had a cop yelling at me only to have some type of, I guess it's not an act of God, but some kind of uh, deus ex machina end to it. Some kind of God in the machine where out of nowhere something happens to prevent any further trouble. <laughs> it's literally like out of a movie, right? Uh, so uh, a friend of mine at work, I'm telling her the story and she's like, you know, that's a really good omen. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. It is. In 2013, anytime the state tries to stomp its boot on me or even hints that they're about to, uh, maybe something will happen uh, to prevent them from doing that. Uh, I'm not obviously hoping for any kind of violence or pain upon anybody, but um, on a purely conceptual level, maybe that'll happen. Maybe maybe Nima will be saved by the bell or saved by the god in the machine uh, for, for the rest of the year. Uh, I mean, I'm not really superstitious, so... I don't think of it that way, but uh, hey, it's a nice story, right? It's nice something to say. <laughs> All right. Ah, one other thing about it I did want to mention was, um, you know, in any other situation that was similar, but if you removed the cop status from those folks, um, I wouldn't have thought twice about getting out and helping. Uh, I've done that on several occasions. You know, I, I was driving home on Mopac, one of the main freeways here in Austin once. Um, it was late at night, and I was probably coming home, you know, from uh, working. And I saw a car in front of me just swerved off the, the freeway into the grass, spun out, went across on the other side of the freeway, right? Originally swerved off to the left on the freeway. Swerve spins across a whole four lanes, hits a pole uh, on the right median of the freeway. Uh, car smoking, it just looked awful. Um, without hesitation, I pulled off, off beside him, um, got out, saw if he was okay, um, stayed there till help arrived, uh, talked to him. Uh, he wasn't badly injured. He was pretty drunk, so uh, I guess he didn't brace himself. He, he was kind of like a rag doll. So no, no massive injuries to him. He seemed fine. But I, I stayed there and helped. 
um, you know, I, I have a habit of doing this, uh, or of at least checking to see if people need help. Uh, and I guess I did do that in this situation. I did ask them if they needed help, um, but they responded with yelling at me. So, uh, I, you know, I asked a couple more times and, and then left. Um, but A, if they didn't have this special status and I was merely a mundane to them, I think uh, they wouldn't have yelled at me in the first place. So I could have probably got out and helped them and felt more comfortable about it. Uh, but the state, the fact that they are agents of the state, scared me into wanting to remove myself from the situation. Uh, I don't know how much help I could have provided. Um, I don't know those things. Uh, you know, I, I don't know because the situation wasn't anything but what it was. Um, I'm just saying I, I think I would have been a lot more apt and a lot less afraid of getting out and helping uh, if, if they didn't have the force of the state behind them. So what I wanted to t talk about next is uh, it was New Year, and being as such, uh, people were yammering on about the fiscal cliff bullshit, uh, which we all know is bullshit. And I'm going to explain why in just a bit. Uh, hold on a second. Somebody's messaging me on Facebook. Don't you? I mean, I, I love that. I love that I can talk to people on Facebook, but Facebook should have a thing. Maybe it does. I don't know. Somebody should... Facebook message me this if if you can do it. Can you turn off the sounds of somebody messaging messaging you in Facebook? Um, is there an away status in Facebook? Can I be on it looking at people's posts and other things and looking at my own page without having that click whenever somebody wants to message me? Because people message me all the time, man. If I'm on Facebook, somebody's going to be saying something. And I love it. I don't want to discourage anybody from doing that. But, um, you know, if I leave that tab open while I'm on the show, uh, it can be distracting. See, I already lost my train of thought. <laughs> all right. Well, okay. Here it is. That's why I have notes, and I'm going to stick to them, uh, unlike when I'm with Michael when uh, we just ramble on about things. But it ends up being really awesome. All right. So hopefully this will end up being really awesome, too. But I'm going to stick to the notes. The next thing on the notes. Ah, yes. The Fiscal Cliff Bullshit. Because uh, that's what it is. Uh, even the, the name of it. The Fiscal Cliff. Uh, it's just ridiculous. Um, and it's also... An, it's obscuring the fact that all of these problems were caused by the government in the first place. Because in the mainstream narrative, there must be a deal, right? We must avoid the Fiscal Cliff. We have to have some kind of a deal. Uh, as if... The government who created this cliff can somehow, I don't know, fill it in with fill dirt or whatever you do to prevent yourself from falling into a cliff, grow wings on the economy. Um, this is stuff they can't do. Uh, they can always do net negatives. They can dig the hole. They can blow up stuff and make a cliff or a big crater in the ground. Um but the government can't ever do a net positive. They can't create wealth. They can only destroy it. They can only move it around. They can take a bunch of dirt out of this thing and make it a cliff and make a mountain somewhere else, but they can't, they can't create something from nothing. So the whole fiscal cliff BS... Ah, uh, yes, the fiscal cliff. A uh, problem that's not really a problem. If you think about it, what it is, it's a combination of, um, well, I guess it is a problem because one of the things is the Bush tax cuts expiring. Uh, so more taxes, that's a problem. I'll, I'll take that as a valid problem. Um, the other thing is um, the spending cuts, the proposed spending cuts, which are really just cuts on proposed spending, not any real deep cuts that would actually make much of a difference. Just basic cuts to bureaucrats' wages and programs that don't really matter and shouldn't exist in the first place. So what does Congress do? What What, what is this deal they're trying to come up with? What did they come up with? The Senate uh, passed uh, a basic a basically a, what they call a fix for the fiscal cliff. And what it does is it raises taxes. Um, bipartisan. I think there were eight people who voted against it in the Senate. Eight people. Eight people who think that, um, that uh, taxes, raising taxes is not a good thing. That's it. 
Um, and maybe they voted against it for different reasons. We don't know. Uh, or at least I haven't seen and or heard. Um, so these these fuckers are going to basically steal more money from you. That's that's their solution, right? Right. Oh, well, we're going to have uh, an economic slowdown. So what are we going to do? We're going to take more money out of the economy. Um, you know, and this this whole soak the rich stuff, it doesn't even work on its face. On its face, it is nothing more than obvious slavery. Uh, the top rate, at least proposed by the Senate, the top tax rate will now be about 40%. That's, of course, just on income. If you really think about the money that the government extracts from you, it's more than just the income tax. They, they extract money from you when you sell something. They extract money from you when you buy something. Uh, they extract money from you um, here and there whenever they can. So, But if we just, just look at that top tax rate, uh, which is going to be about 40% on people making more than $400,000 in income. Uh, so 40%... Of four hundred thousand dollars, that's a hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So the government will automatically steal that amount. So in essence, if somehow you'd worked your way up through the ranks or through your business or provided goods and services to various people to where you make that much money, the government will take almost half of it. 40%. So if you make $400,000, they will take $160,000. You'll be left with $240,000. <laughs> so that's actually less than the other bracket of what they call wealthy Americans. So you won't even be in that top bracket anymore. At least the money you make won't be there. You'll make 240 you'll only get $240,000 of that $400,000 that you earned from the sweat of your brow. That's just income. How is that not slavery? How, how is it not slavery to extract almost half of just your income? It's utter lunacy, utter immorality, clothed in these vague ideas of soaking the rich to pay for the less fortunate, which they don't do. Uh, this money is not going to go to any kind of efficient program or any kind of efficient, anything as efficient as a private charity to actually help people. Uh, no, it's going to go to blowing people up. It's going to go to giant pensions, uh, giant welfare payments to corporate entities. Um, it's going to go to a bunch of horrible things. Um, and, and also, you could look about it this way. Uh, the government is basically taking away or reducing one of man's truest motivators, money. Uh, you cannot tell me, I don't think I would buy any argument saying that, that money or resources, because that's in essence what money is there, it's, it's there to acquire more resources, that that's not, it's not the, it, it is the most true motivator of just about any living creature. It's acquiring resources. That's not humans. That's, that's lions eating the gazelles. That's um, gazelles looking for water. Those resources are really important. So the government's trying to take away, take away that incentive to get more resources. It reminds me of uh, in 1984 when the party officials work so hard. This is one of their big programs in 1984. The government works so hard to eliminate the orgasm. That's one of their, their big goals, is to get rid of the orgasm so that they can reduce any competing loyalties to the party. Because, of course, if you, if you have an orgasm, you probably feel some kind of love to the person who uh, helps you achieve that orgasm. Uh, and if you're not married, then you obviously feel some kind of, some kind of loyalty, or at least you're in the, the method, in the hobby of actively looking for that through various different partners. Uh, and you're using your resources to do that instead of using your resources to uh, help the party, to help the government, to further the quote-unquote greater good. Um, the other thing is deal or no deal on this so-called fiscal cliff, even if they don't do anything about it. Um, payroll taxes are set to raise anyway. Um, none of the, the proposed plans address payroll taxes, uh, and that affects people pretty much across the board. So even folks making around $30,000 a year, they'll get an extra $50 a month stolen from them on average. An extra $50, they'll be poorer on average. Um, <laughs> you know, and those, those are, are people 
that are trying to make it. Uh, the people that make that amount of money, you know, they're usually young people like me, recently out of college with a bunch of student loan debt because the government institutions begged them to go into debt to, to go to college because everything would be hunky-dory if we did that, right? Um, and the rest of all this fiscal cliff talk is really just a bunch of numbers games and and moving around stolen money and trying to figure out a way to steal it to where the most people will be the most happy with it uh, within the paradigm of institutionalized theft, of course. Um, it's not really in any of the mainstream conversation. It's probably considered radical or extremist to talk about, well, hey, maybe maybe in the fiscal cliff deal, taxes should be zero and uh, government spending should be zero. Uh, unfortunately, that which is really the most reasonable fix for the problems uh, that's never discussed. Um, so really all that's going to happen, uh, either way, like, like Ben Stone says, either way, even if, if somehow some politicians win on this and prevent taxes from getting hiked up and keep uh, those spending cuts or even make m deeper spending cuts, they're not going to be that deep. It's basically going to be the government stealing more money from just about everybody, spending more of that, and borrowing and printing in order to spend all that. I mean, the Federal Reserve is doing, what, QE Infinity now or something like that. Um so to me, the obvious solution then is if you really want to avoid a deeper depression because, you know, we're not talking about getting into a new recession here. <laughs> we don't we've never crawled out. You know, these green shoots, any of this stuff is just silly. Um, ask the average person. You know, nobody's nobody feels better off financially. Um, I guess on an individual basis, you could be doing better relatively, but uh, as a whole, the economy's in the tank, and it's going to continue to tank. Uh, so if you wanted to do something, you know, even outside of the realm of pushing the button to get rid of the state, um, even if you wanted to take some kind of gradual approach, you'd really have to talk about uh, some pretty drastic things. Um, you know, I would say... Even in this minarchist government uh, paradigm, uh, the the United States government could sell all of the Amer American military assets overseas. You know, the the hundreds or thousands of bases they have in hundreds of countries around the world, the massive floating fortresses, uh, which we call aircraft carriers, the submarines, um, the airstrips. Uh, get rid of all of those. Uh, bring the troops home. And if that's too extreme, at the very least, stop foreign aid. How come How come that's not on the mainstream debate? Uh, at least not seriously. Why, why are we worried about taking care of ourselves so much? Why is it this massive fiscal cliff, and yet we still accept the concept that we give billions of dollars to other governments around the world? Do we really need to be paying for bureaucrats in Turkey, bureaucrats in Israel, bureaucrats in Saudi Arabia, uh, hell, even bureaucrats in the occupied territories of Palestine? Um, we don't need to be spending any money on that. Or I, I, I guess I don't mean we, but the U.S. government doesn't need to be spending any money on that, doesn't need to be stealing any money to spend money on that. Uh, it's just insanity. Um, other solutions, uh, why not open up the vast amounts of government-owned American wilderness in the West? Open it up to homesteaders. Um, I think the United States government owns something like 50% of the land in the American West. There's a map you can see. Um, Google it, and uh, it, it shows the chunks of, uh, of Wyoming, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Montana the chunks of these geographical distinctions that are just pretty much lying fallow. They're, they're government land. Nothing productive is done with them. Uh, I guess there are a few that are, you know, national park areas, national forest, yada, yada, yada. Uh, you know, you don't have to touch those to make a big dent. I, I would, you know, in, in Libpair, I think um, somebody would buy those. Somebody who loves the nature would buy those and take care of them. Uh, great real world example, the Appalachian Trail. You know, it's one of my wife's dreams to hike the Appalachian Trail. We actually watched... Um, it was a mainstream media thing on it. It was Nat Geo. Uh, and one of the things about it is the Appalachian Trail is 
pretty much 99% of the work done on it to maintain it and keep it pristine is done by volunteers. One of the most important trails in America, spanning something like 13 or maybe 11 states, uh, pretty much going from you know Georgia up to Maine. All volunteers, no state coercion or, or very little state coercion involved in it. Uh, it's just human action, voluntary human action. Um, so the government could hands off on all these things, all these wilderness areas in the West and... The whole economy, the economy as a whole, would be that much richer for it because people could go in and actually do things that would create wealth on them. They could homestead these things. Think about the drop in the housing bubble. You Think, think about the amount of land, the, the reduction in costs if there was all this land that was all of a sudden opened up to people to go homestead it. Uh, it would be amazing. Uh, it would be a real game changer. Uh, I mean, obviously... Uh, in my plan, no, there's no central plan for liberty, but so, so things that we need to address. Violence, government violence that needs to stop and could conceivably be stopped, uh, you know, in a gradual sense if we went that far. Get rid of uh, all the cabinet level employees. Get rid of the DEA, get rid of the FBI, the ATF. Think of all the money we'd save in not paying these fat salaries and these fat pensions to people who spent 20 years in the FBI or, or the ATF. What good is the ATF ever done for anybody in the world other than killing little children in Waco and shooting people just because they don't like the way they talk about the government? Think about that. Get rid of that. What good does the ATF provide? Nothing. It is vampiric. It is parasitic. Get rid of the Department of Education. Um, Hell, even if you reduce the government down to the size it was 10 years ago, which, which would include those things, you'd leave enough money in the economy for a real recovery to start. I just don't understand all of the wrangling to steal a few billion here or, or steal a few billion there, uh, steal more money from the rich. Um, you know, it, it, it amounts to a few billions of dollars or maybe even a few hundred billion dollars uh, when all is said and done. Um, but the government debt and the, and the unfunded liabilities, they're in the trillions, right? They, they are so massive that all, all this kind of stuff, it's not an effective solution. All it is is adding more aggression to the world. All it is is taking more money out of productive members. It's taking more from those people who actually work for their money. Uh, it's like... It's like if Scarface, right, the, the gangster, not the, not the rapper, but uh, Al Pacino, Scarface, right? Imagine he lost his cocaine connect, right? He, he couldn't sell cocaine anymore, didn't, didn't have that fat uh, black market money coming in, and he still had this giant mansion, right, that giant mansion with the, the dual staircase and the big fountain and the say hello to my little friend and all that. Imagine he lost uh, the main way of paying for that. Um, lost the main way of paying the car note on his Murcielago uh, or whatever. And, and w w would it be wise for him to start picking pockets to pay that mortgage on his mansion or to pay the car note? <laughs> How well would that work? Uh, would he do that? He would not be rational in any sense to try to do that. He's not going to make up for that amount of money by going. And even if he robbed everybody all day, every day, I, I don't think he could, he could make it. Um, it's it's just not a viable thing. It's not it's not something a rational a, a reasonable person would think of to do. Uh, so just utter ridiculousness in, in the mainstream narrative on this. And uh, I whatever maybe libertarian one hundred and one, uh, maybe anarchist one hundred and one. But um, I felt it was worth pointing out. All right, we're gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna take a little stop here, sell some things, and come back with more. A science fiction comic adventure from Big Head Press. Quantum Vibe! It's year 2523. There are colonies on Venus, Mars, and Mercury. People travel in bubbles, fly at hyperspeed. With brain implants and artificial gravity. A scientific genius and his clever assistant set out on an adventure through the solar system on a secret mission to find the key to access new frontiers and save liberty. Quantum vibe. There's a robot girl and zany creatures made with genetically engineered features. And corporate villains crave the opportunity to steal a profit from mother's ingenuity. A scientific genius and his clever assistant set out on an adventure through the solar system on a secret mission to find the key to access new frontiers and save liberty. Quantum vibe. 
All right, folks, uh, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, I do want to let you know that the state speech is hate speech buttons. Uh, they are awesome, and the plain and cap ones are out. Uh, we are still selling them, and in fact, uh, they're popular, so I think we're going to go ahead and offer them as a regular part of a five-pack of Fiends buttons. Uh, not 100% sure on this yet, but I think that's what we're going to do. Um, me and Michael have discussed that. Uh, so they're, you know, filled of black, I think yellow writing, or maybe the opposite. They say state speech is hate speech. Uh, and of course, Michael coined that a few episodes ago, and uh, literally within a few minutes after coining it, uh, Krizzle, our good friend who makes buttons, you can check him out at uh, Krizzle's Buttons, he um, he had some pressed. Um, you know, he's kind of a anarcho syndicalist so his were uh, a little bit of a different style. We asked him if he could just do, you know, plain text, uh, two colors, Red or sorry, yellow and black. Just state speech is hate speech. Um, so a nice, simple way of equating state action with hate action. Um, of course, with speech instead of action. But still, you get the point. Um, so yeah, uh, nowadays I think in the near future you'll be able to buy a five pack of Fiends buttons. You know, you'll get that. Um, you'll get our beautiful Freedom Fiends model wearing her Freedom Fiends shirt. Uh, you'll get one that just says gunsandweed.com uh, you'll get the worms that's a great one the worms is a great one uh, and um, and anarchy gumbo with the shrimp I believe those are the five um, so yeah uh, check that out in the very near future at least keep your eye out for it definitely helps us when you buy buttons uh, it helps us uh, to put that money back into the fiends so we can keep producing good content for you folks uh, it also helps to spread the fiendage uh, you know if you're wearing those around town uh, I was very proud to see my little brothers um, each of them on their backpacks you know their jackets and, and such were all fiend buttoned out so you know decked out with lots of fiends buttons good conversation starter too you know somebody's looking at your buttons and one says guns and weed uh it can lead to a little discussion which is very good way of uh, of promoting liberty and and fiendom or freedom i guess <laughs> uh and so yeah i mean hell state speech is hate speech that's so catchy i, I might even turn it into a song We'll see. Uh, speaking of songs, uh, A Gun for Everyone is still getting views, which is very good. Uh, it's over 4,000 now. You know, I'd love to get that way higher. But uh, without any kind of big libertarian bump like the Lou Rockwell bump, it's pretty decent for, uh, I guess, a little bit more than a week now. Um, you know, it actually had a post-Christmas bump. I was trying really hard to get it out before Christmas because I thought, you know, that's when people are going to be watching it because it's kind of Christmas-themed. You know, it's got uh, the bad Quaker Ben Stone dancing around around in a Santa outfit uh, and you know there's some Christmas terminology there basically you know get get an AK for Christmas that kind of good stuff um but I guess a lot of people um, took a holiday from consuming alternative media during the Christmas break, or at least were with family and didn't really have time to um, to spend time killing time on the internet and watching videos and reading blogs. So we had a nice little bump uh, since Christmas actually ended, and I'm glad for that. Uh, in fact, we've got a few haters viewing it too, a few people who don't disagree with the concept uh, or the video, which is good because it means the horizons of people seeing it are broader than just those who agree with it um in fact one the most recent hater left a comment on the youtube video and says uh we need more guns like our kids need more holes in their heads uh, that was the comment from one hater on the youtube video again i'll read that and if you missed it the hater says we need more guns like our kids need more holes in their heads all right so let's take a bit of time to i guess unpack the stupidity here um if everyone else in that school had a gun, not just Adam Lanza, what would have happened? Think about it. And I'm not talking about arming the teachers. This isn't an NRA thing. It's also not a, who was it, Barbara Boxer or Feinstein or one of those horrible statist harpies in Congress. It's not a, we need stormtroopers and government officials with guns standing outside of schools. It's not a thing like that. No. What if everyone... As the song implies, what if everyone else in that school had a gun, not just Adam Lanza? What would have happened? Uh, I mean, the title of the song is A Gun for Everyone. The title of the song is not More Guns, it's not Guns for Teachers, or anything like that. The right 
to self-defense is a universal principle. Everyone has the right to self-defense. It's universal. Uh, and not even just people. Uh, everything, every gazelle has a right to run away as fast as it can from a lion or kick a lion in the eye as the lion is trying to chomp down on its other leg. Um, that is a universal principle. Uh, and you can even borrow a bit from Stefan Molyneux. You can ask, well, hey, is it logically possible for everyone to be able to defend themselves at the same time? Is it logically possible? Yes, it is logically possible. Everyone in the world, I'm saying everyone for extra emphasis. So if you're listening, Michael, I'm not saying ev everyone wrong. I'm saying everyone to 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 stick it in your brain uh, peacefully, of course. Um, so yeah, if it, it is logically possible for everyone to be able to defend themselves at the same time. Everyone in the world could have a pistol on their hip. They could have a foul on their back, shotgun on their back, some kind of long gun on their back, pistol on their hip. Hell, they could have a sword in a hilt on the side of their hip. They could have an ankle holster. They could be completely decked out. They could be in shogun uniform. They could ha be like Master Sergeant or Master Chief in Halo and have a full body environment suit and be impervious um, and, and still have a nice little anti-assault rifle. I like that little term. Uh, there's a, a shop in Utah selling the anti-assault rifle. It is, of course, just an AR-15, but uh, I love that turn of phrase to uh, throw it back in the faces of the anti-defense uh, people out there because that's really what they are. So everyone could be completely decked out, have all the weapons in the world they want on themselves, um, and at the same time, not hurt anybody. They could logically do it, A, uh, and the fact that they were logically doing it would not mean anybody else's property being violated or any one person being hurt. By any kind of necessity. No, that would not be involved in, in it to, to have that logically happen at all. Um, so that means it's universal. This is kind of a little mutated, um, universally preferable behavior of Stefan Molyneux. Uh, but I think it's interesting to talk about it this way. Um, so if you look at that, you say, okay, everyone can have a gun that's logically universal. Um, and, and at the same time, uh, it doesn't require any kind of aggression or any violation of the non-aggression principle in order for that to happen. Uh, but so-called gun control cannot at all pass the same test. It calls for certain gun purchases to be restricted under penalty of men with those same guns pointing at them, uh, pointing them at the intended purchases and seller. So... Let's try to universalize that, and you can't, right? Uh, can everyone point guns at someone who tries to buy a semi-automatic rifle? Can everyone point guns at someone who tries to buy a semi-automatic rifle? Um, I don't think that that can, that, that can work out logically. I, uh, <laughs> just think of what would happen if you showed up at a local police department as they were handing out a new batch of AR-15s or M4s and said, sorry, but those guns are banned. If you take one, I'll arrest you. If you resist, I'll shoot you. How do you think that would work out for you? I don't think it would work out too well. Um, so you couldn't have a situation where everyone where it was universal, where everyone is allowed to, or it's appropriate for everyone to point guns at someone who tries to buy a semi-automatic rifle, because in the gun controller's argument, they would also include, well, obviously, the police are exempt from this. Obviously, the military is exempt from this, uh, because it's not universal, right? I couldn't, I couldn't prevent uh, those people with the blue uniforms or those people with the green uniforms from buying guns. I couldn't do the same thing they would do to me back to them. You see? So gun control is not a moral action that can be universalized. Uh, it's not across the board. It's not consistent. It's not natural. It is artificial. And it's only possible. Gun control as conceived of by all these Hollywood stars, uh, <laughs> all these goons, all these so-called lawmakers, gun control as conceived of by them is only possible with the aggressive domination of one group of people over the other. Any gun control proposition is by necessity a call 
for moral inequality. You can't call for gun control as the way it's conceived of now and also see every human being as morally equal, as abiding by the same set of morals. It's a call for some people to be slaves and some people to be masters. <laughs> That's what it's a call for. When you call for gun control, you are asking for the same principle to be applied as exists with the slave and master relationship. And regardless of the ends that they look for, which I would say it's very arguable that you would achieve less shootings and less massacres with more control, gun control. But I don't even think, I think that's beside the point. Because regardless of the ends, the means it would be of a moral outrage so much larger in magnitude than the school massacres. Stick with me on this. Um, the that the means of gun control is more of a moral outrage. It's so much larger of a moral outrage than the school massacres because it's from this slave and master dichotomy, which is in essence the state that flows all state violence. And all state violence is somewhere in the area of 200 million deaths in the last century alone. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's a conservative estimate. Um, 200 million deaths caused by this concept of, of having different moral categories, of having it okay for one group of people to point guns and shoot them at people and have that be accepted socially and legitimized socially by academics and media people and propaganda. Uh, <laughs> that is so much more than the amount of deaths from uh, a crazy person taking one gun and, and going to a school. Now, uh, it's still horrible. I'm not trying to downplay the horribleness of the school massacres. I'm just trying to give some perspective on the amount of deaths. And, and you say, well, because I asked Michael, what, what's, what's really that different about the Connecticut massacre from you know, the Batman thing and, and Virginia Tech and, and all these other ones we've had? Uh, it says it's the kids, right? It's little kindergartners or first graders or uh, young kids. Uh, you know, they had a whole lives ahead of them. And, and very tragic. But in this 200 million of deaths caused by the concept of the state, caused by this moral inequality, in that, there's a bunch of children, a good, large portion of them that are children, that are children that, um, that suffered worse deaths than a bullet to them. Um, children that were starved to death, died slow painful death, uh, children whose legs were blown off and bled slowly to death, horrible, horrible things. So remind your status friends of this as much as you can stand to do uh, because it is an arduous task and, and, you know, there's the concept of triage and don't waste too much time and energy. But, um, but when people say something like, like arming, arming more guns or, or letting more people have guns or, or dispersing that power is insane, when they call it insane and say things like, we need more guns, like we need more holes in our kids' heads, remind them of this. Remind them of what's really insane is this concept of legitimizing violence when certain people do it. No, violence and aggression are wrong no matter who does it. Unless you universalize that moral principle, you will have a situation where those who are given a pass, those who are given a legitimate, um, those whose killings are legitimized, they will kill more people. They will be more likely to because it's socially acceptable. So remind your status friends of this as much as you can stand to do. Remind them that gun control is responsible for millions of deaths and school massacres. <laughs> uh, gun control is responsible for these things. And while it's unbelievably tragic, uh, you know, things like Connecticut, it's still not as tragic as what the premise behind gun control has done to the world. All right. Um... I was going to read the glossary if I needed to fill more time, but we're already at uh, 51 minutes. Um, I did want to talk a little bit uh, about something that's related to this, this defense concept and the concept of, uh, of, of what I was just talking about. Um, 
you know, there was recently in Memphis, I believe, I believe it was in East Memphis, uh, a young man was convicted of murdering a pizza delivery driver who tried to deliver a pizza to them. It was, um, I believe what they did was lured him into an abandoned house. You know, they gave a, a, an address of a house that was abandoned. They jumped the guy. Their intention was to steal his money and steal the pizza. Um, and when the pizza delivery guy tried to resist, he was shot by the attacker. Um looked into it a little bit and apparently it's a thing in memphis like this isn't the first time a a delivery driver has been attacked in fact in the past um a delivery driver for a different shop in memphis um he carried a 38 special revolver with him and actually shot back when he was attacked by somebody with the same uh caliber weapon uh, another 38 revolver um and defended himself and lived to tell about it didn't die uh and um there was Another person who didn't have a gun but um, had a tent pole that he put up his sleeve when he was going into uh, a shady situation and had heard news reports about various people in Memphis, various delivery drivers being attacked in Memphis and decided, well, this is kind of shady. I'm going to go ahead and put this tent pole up my sleeve. Uh, And he was attacked and did defend himself with the tent pole. Uh, Luckily, his attackers didn't have a gun. He defended himself with the tent pole successfully and um, wasn't fired but was demoted. So he doesn't get to drive anymore. And uh, to put that into perspective, if, if you're a delivery driver, you can make bank. It's it's pretty lucrative as far as no skill. Uh, I'd say there is skill involved, but as as far as these easy to get, uh, quick money jobs, it's it's pretty lucrative. Um, but if you're not a driver and you work at a pizza shop, you don't make much at all. It's like working at McDonald's. Uh, so he was basically had his income probably slashed by two thirds or three fourths um, because he didn't curl up into a ball, I guess. Uh, And the reason I'm saying this is because in all of these stories, it is mentioned, and it is a paragraph, and it should be, that these companies, because one was Papa John's, uh, one was Pizza Hut, um, I, of course, work for the other big player in the game, uh, so I know that from experience. All of these companies have a policy explicitly stated that delivery drivers cannot carry a weapon while they are working for the company. Delivery drivers are not allowed to carry a weapon. In essence, they are not allowed to defend themselves. I mean, I guess yeah, you, if you know some some Chuck Norris shit, more power to you. Uh, but even Chuck Norris shit is not that effective when somebody's got a knife at you or a gun at you. Uh, you don't take fists to a knife fight or fists to a gunfight. I would say even if you are Chuck Norris, I'm sure people will slam me on that and say, you know, Chuck Norris could take fists to a nuclear exchange and live to tell about it uh, and just punch those warheads back into the stratosphere (laughs) but uh we can't all be chuck norris so uh, i guess what i'm saying about this is it becomes a decision for the individual on what is really right because i think the companies the pop john's domino's pizza huts of the world they are pressured into this uh, this is a legalese thing. This is the judicial system that has pressured them into these policies. And, you know, I thought initially when I was reading all these stories, you know, this policy should change. We should, I should make it a point to help promote that these policies should change. And the state is just so slow at this kind of stuff. And since the state is so involved in this and in their liability and how the insurance deals with these companies, that it would be mired in years and years of protesting and action and filing briefs, I think, to get this policy changed and getting millions of people to complain about it. And it just doesn't seem effective or viable. Um, Now, we at Freedom Fiends don't advise anybody to break the law and we, Guess, I guess, conversely, we shouldn't really advise or give any legal advice to anybody. But what some of the comments in these things, like on, on the guy who was delivering pizza, had a thirty eight special and avoided death by shooting back at an attacker who came at him with another thirty eight special. This driver, um, he lived to tell about it. And in the comments, people are like, well, 
yeah, I would much rather be alive to deal with getting fired and maybe talk to the cops a little bit. I would much rather be alive to do that than be dead and have followed the, pol the company policy to a T. Um, I kind of just want to leave it at that. Uh, I will say that, that you know, it's, it's up to you and, and you would have to weigh that in your head. Uh, it seems to me the more reasonable person would say, I'll risk it. I would rather, which would you rather lose, right? Would you rather lose a pizza delivery job or your entire life? Um, so just something to ponder on. I won't get too specific. Too, I won't get much more specific than that, but I kind of did want to end it on that. And, and those kinds of things can apply to other areas. Um, Michael had a thing when we were talking about signs and private property and, and no gun signs and things like that. And um, the concept that, well, your body is private property too. <laughs> so what you wear on your body is also private property. And uh, so I don't know if just by virtue of being inside of a public shop or, se or public selling places, if that private property should supersede your own body's private property or if you should just stay out of the shop. But it's important to note that uh, it's nobody's responsibility but your own to ensure your continued existence. Um, you can't count on policies or companies or cops or anybody else uh, to ensure your continued existence. In the end, it's all up to you. And so I will leave you with that, fiends. I appreciate you listening. And uh, do come back. Michael should be back on for the regular Thursday live show, The Freedom Fiends Agenda. And I'm sure he'll be raring to go and ready to tell us all about how the state made his wife cry. And go ahead and brainstorm solutions for what to do about the horrible state oppression in the medical field. All right, that's it for me. Peace and worms. Love the fiends and want to help out? We do take donations and we put them back into our Liberty Projects. You can make a donation by clicking on the spinning coin on any post. But what if you want to help, but you ain't got no cash? Or you made a donation and you want to help more? Here's how you can help. Download and seed our torrents to help keep us drone proof. There's a torrent club link at the top of freedomfiends.com. You can also blog the fiends and share episode links on Facebook, Twitter, and elsewhere. You can rate and review our movies on Amazon and IMDb. You can rate and review the Freedom Fiends and Anarchy Gumbo and our songs on iTunes. That really helps a lot. You can buy our movies and share them with friends or give them out as gifts. And one of the best ways to spread liberty is to buy a bunch of Freedom Fiends buttons and give them out as gifts. Wholesale prices are available and you can also comment on our site or better yet, comment about us on other sites. And please email the site link to all your friends. Thanks for helping spread the Fiend's message worldwide to as many Liberty people as you can, especially to those who don't yet get it. You rock. Hello, Freedom Fiends. It's your boy, Dean, from the U.S. Get the U.S. out my bloodstream. I owe me and that includes indoor fiends. No one won't ask permission and I won't say please. Freedom fans, one fact that I gotta make clear. The Freedom Fiends podcast is covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. Do what you want with it and spread it around. Tell two friends. Make copies. Email it to everyone you know. Go on the site and comment. This is a conversation. Three times a week, Michael W. Dean and Nima Vidati share their own unique take on the way the world works and how to find your place in it. Available from freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network. Subscribe and tell two friends. And remember, the only power they have is the power you allow them. We're not saying the Freedom Fiends are the one true path to anarchist liberation, but it's a good one. If you want to put your voluntarist money where your mouth is, consider making a donation to the Freedom Fiends. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the spinning coin on any post. Then make a one-time gift via PayPal, or set up a monthly contribution of as little as $3. Giving to the Freedom Fiends helps advance